Hi. Welcome. Uh, as usual, you ask questions, I try to answer them. Question number one. Uh, during one of the podcasts, uh, you've mentioned that you tried to get a job at Amazon uh, while you were living in America. Can you tell a bit more about it? Yeah, it's a true story, and I have a blog post about it where I explained my experience, how it happened. Uh, they approached me, the recruiter approached me, and they suggested that they might be interested in me. So they asked me for a CV. That's a traditional process, how it goes with recruiters. And then I met with them. I actually traveled to them because they were in Seattle and I was in, in, um, in Silicon Valley, which is close to San Francisco. So I traveled to them and we met with them. And, and it was all, everything was so... Uh, exciting exciting and i actually thought that i would get this job i was interested but after the meeting with the the technical guys it everything just just fell apart because the people who were talking to me they were at the interview they were not the people who talked to me before they were not the recruiters who approached me they were not the people who were uh, motivated to get me on board, who actually knew something about me, who actually uh, found me somewhere, who actually who actually were interested to uh, to get exactly me. So they just gave me instead. They gave me just a bunch of technical programmers who knew nothing about me. I was just yet another regular candidate for them, and they gave me yet another regular piece of programming task. And they said. Could you please write this piece of code? Can you uh, write me the, the whole algorithm for, there was a task for something like the elevators are moving up and down. So tell us about how you're going to optimize the movement of the elevators. I believe it's a classic task for programming interview. But in my case, in my case, it was, uh, it looked kind of irrelevant to me because I was not planning to become a programmer who was going to solve the problems with the elevators. I was planning to become an architect. I was more interested in some kind of a, uh, things, some kind of a contribution to design of the Amazon internal software and hardware, something like that. But they were treating me like a, like a, just a programmer. So there was a mismatch and I was kind of uh, disappointed of this. And that's why I wrote the blog post and I said that I'm not going to talk to Google interviewers anymore. That's the name of the blog post. You can, you can find it on my blog. And actually this blog post was extremely popular on Hacker News at that time. And it was republished by a number of uh, journals at that time. So the, 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 the problem is bigger than my case. The problem is that um, the, the recruiters, uh, they uh, misintegrate candidates and, and the teams who need those candidates. Because recruiters, they don't understand... Uh, it's not just they don't understand. They actually understand, but they are they are they are building a wall between the the team who needs the people and the people who needs the team, and uh, they, they don't they are disconnected while the discussion is happening with is happening with the recruiters. And when they get connected eventually, when the team meets the candidate, it's too late. And at this point of time, uh, the candidate uh, gets. Uh, very frustrated and the team gets frustrated because they don't know each other. They don't understand what, what, what each of them are looking for, what the project manager is looking for and what the, um, the candidate is looking for. They just don't know each other. So a better approach, a better mechanism would be to connect the, the hiring manager, the, the team leader, the, the project manager of the team with the candidate as soon as possible and then let them talk. And that's the point of my blog post. So I'm saying it's, I would love to skip the recruitment process, to skip those recruiters and just go directly to the people who, who need me, who potentially may hire me, and then talk, talk to them directly. And now if somebody approaches me, some recruiters, I try to give this answer to them directly. I just tell them that, who, who are you? Are you the, the recruiter or you are the person who's going to be my boss? So if you are the recruiter, then just just connect me to the boss. I'm not going to talk to you. I'm not going to tell you all the details. I'm not going to discuss you and my profile with you because you don't understand what it is, because you're not a technical person. You, you're not qualified enough to understand me. It's not just I'm, I'm thinking too much about myself. You just it, These people are just not programmers. It doesn't matter whether I'm a good programmer or a bad programmer. I just want to talk to programmers when, when, I'm, uh, when, when there is a potential company who wants to hire me. Unfortunately, not every recruiter is, is capable of, uh, of connecting me directly to, you know, to the hiring manager. But 
uh, sometimes it's worse just losing the connection and, and just saying no to the recruiter and then just wasting time and wasting your uh, motivation and your energy on 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 that stories like like that the story that happened to me so i just i spent a lot of time on that i spent a lot of energy i was motivated i was interested i i actually started i i started i remember that i was actually starting to build my plans i was thinking okay i'm going to move to seattle i'm going to work here i was studying what's happening in amazon how they manage projects and all that and then eventually just it just everything just blew up because of the mistake i made in the beginning in the beginning i had to ask them connect me to the people who who actually want me who actually want me so that's the story and you can read about it next question uh how do you recommend handling a developer's salary save and invest or invest in self how did you manage finances at 25 when when i was 25 there was a different story not like what you guys have now when you're 25 so we didn't have that much money for programmers and when i was 25 programmers were making maybe 100 dollars a month maybe 150 so that was the reality so now you're making about 10 times or sometimes 20 or 30 times more than i was making when i was your age so it was not the question of investing at that time we were just getting the money and spending them all of it actually was not even enough to to buy shoes for, for, for that money so now the situation is different so you are actually able to invest into something and to to save money somehow um so you you i think you should uh, you should when you're 25 you should take some some part of your income and then uh, and just save it how to save that's a huge question i don't have an answer because now the world is going through a crazy time even the the united states dollar is not anymore an interesting uh, place to put your capitals because it, the, the the inflation is uh, extremely high and the, the the prices for the things which we were buying five years ago now in the united states dollars they cost more well sometimes way more so saving into dollars is not a any more uh, an attractive idea saving into real estate also most probably not a good idea so i don't have an answer i don't know how to do it right so maybe the best answer would be to invest into yourself but uh, i don't know why you need a lot of money to invest into yourself to do what with this money just buy some books or buy some courses or buy some education maybe but you're saying 25 so maybe 25 is when you already got the, uh, the 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 university education and now it's time to to go to the office and work instead of go to the university and study so i am not a qualified person to give you an answer unfortunately next one what's the meaning of cactus and mushroom in your book covers <laughs> Well, the cactus uh, was, uh, actually I have the cactus, I have the mushroom, and I have also the tomato. So all of them are sort of uh, like, not vegetables, but plants. So they're not animals, they're plants. You know this series, which is uh, O'Reilly series. Uh, many books on this series are about uh, programming languages, about programming technologies, and they all put there the, the, the animals. Yeah, so when I decided to publish, my question was, what do I put on the cover? It's going to be an animal no because the animal is already there so what is going to be let's put it uh, let's make it a plant a tree or something which grows up and then the next question was okay what is going to be if we're talking about object-oriented programming so it's something it has to be something which is uh quite uh solid and uh quite self self-sufficient and self-consistent something that you cannot easily break like the objects right that's something which we want to have in object-oriented programming so we want objects to be solid and, um, and, and um, you know, that being to protect themselves. So the question is, which plant is, it looks like this. Which plant is capable of protecting itself and, uh, and uh, defining the, the, the limits of what you can do with, with this uh, guy, uh, how you can use it? So the answer was quite obvious. It's a cactus because the cactus actually is very defensive plant you cannot easily uh you know cut it you cannot easily harm it because it's very it's very defensive and at the same time quite beautiful uh quite uh, if you look at it uh, from a perspective of an artist then it looks quite beautiful so i hired a number of artists a number of uh painters and i gave them the same task to a few of them and i asked them to draw me a, a cartoon like a 
a, a nice picture of a, uh, of a cactus. And they gave me a number of options. So I, I picked the one and that's what we have. And then when I published another book, the question was, okay, what's going to be another plant? And the next book was uh, 256 Blog Hacks. It's about blogging. And when you blog, what happens when you blog in the wrong direction? They throw tomatoes at you. So that's the, uh, the tomato was found automatically. And then when I wrote uh, Code Ahead, then the question is, what is the, what's the plant which would, be, uh, which would be good enough to talk about management, to talk about project management, to talk about uh, something that uh, may potentially uh, change the way you think about management, something which will actually poison you in the right way. If you eat it, you will be poisoned and you will never be able to understand management the old way. So it's going to be something which will change your life. That was my... That was the plan for the book. So that's what I wanted to happen with the book. So you read it and you get poisoned and you get your life gets changed. So you look at the management from a different perspective from now on. So what's the plan? That's the key. That's the mushroom. Well, the mushroom, which is uh, which is a poison at the same time. So that's how I found the, the plant number three. I'm not sure what's going to be the plant number four. Uh, that's the question for the future. Next question. Uh, Apple has halted sales of the Apple Watch due to a patent dispute with Massimo. Isn't it time to reconsider the patenting procedure and the very essence of this method of copyright, copyright protection? Um, that's an interesting question about patenting. Um, uh, well, I think the patents, they, um, they were invented... I believe like 300 years ago. It was an invention made, uh, I believe, somewhere in America. So they were very concerned about protecting the ideas of people so that the people who invent, they get rich. And people who don't invent, they don't get rich. And, um, and the idea of sharing uh, their inventions with the other people, with the humanity, with the, the whole population of the planet, that idea is not really... Uh, suitable for the capitalist society. In the capitalist society, your 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 main purpose, your main objective in life is actually to to take over other people, to to take to take advantage against other people, and then make those people work for you. The more effective you are in this uh, in accomplishing this goal, the better your life will be, and life of your kids, and life of your grandchildren, and so on and so forth. So your job is to to enslave in a good way, in a bad way, in different ways, to enslave the people who, who who stay around you and then they work for you and you do nothing. You just relax and they... they. So the best way to do it is by making an idea and then protecting this and then hiring the society, hiring the government to defend your idea and to make sure that these people who use your idea, they pay you. You do nothing, you don't work anymore, you just gave them the idea and they pay you for like 20 years or so that's the that's the period the usually the period of 25 years something like that that's how much the government will protect you if you patent the idea that's like i'm i'm just introducing you to, to the to the concept of what the patents are for and now they dispute over these patents these large companies they are just uh, uh trying to uh to find out who's gonna pay who and uh, and i think it's in general uh uh well, I cannot really explain why I think so in details, but I feel that this is a not really a constructive way of organizing inventors and uh, encouraging them to uh, to uh, to create inventions. We definitely need to reward people who create ideas. We definitely need to give them some recognition, to give them some uh, I don't know some money when they invent something interesting, but preventing other companies from using these ideas and blocking the the civilization blocking the the process of moving the the world forward in making new products and making apple watch and making new computers that's i think destructive quite destructive so what's happening is just they are trying to to get some money i think so that's all i can say about it Next question. How do you overcome the time zone difference if your team is extremely distributed? Um, well, 
the, in my view, how I see distributed teams, they are not supposed to be uh, communicating over phone calls or over these Zoom calls or over these uh, conference calls and meetings and everything like that. I think it's uh, it's waste of time, and it's even more waste of time than the meetings which we have which we have inside the office, which we which we uh, conduct in the, in the meeting room. So these online meetings, like Zoom meetings. It's definitely a waste of time. Well, for many reasons. You, you can tell me these reasons better than I do. So it's definitely for uh, for the main reason that, the, that we don't know what these people are doing while they're participating in the meeting. So they probably, they get distracted very easily. In the room, we at least can see their eyes and they, they get engaged in the conversation. Well, most of them, if we especially if we dif- disallow them to use computers, like many people use laptops in, in those boring and long meetings. But if we disallow that, then, then they get engaged. In the online meeting, we cannot do that. So we just waste time of many people at the same time, many people at the same time. So the, be- the best way, of course, is to establish a mechanism for online d- digitalized or written communication. You just use at, at least a chat. At least you use like a Telegram group to discuss what's going on. Or you configure your Slack server or whatever. You, you, you use Slack, Slack service, not server, service. So something which is digital, something which is asynchronous, something where the question comes to me and I can answer this question when I have time. Not when we all sit together and look, in the, in, in, in the, um, look at each other and then this is the moment where I need to make a decision and make an answer. But when it's con- con- convenient for me. That, that would be much better. That's much more professional. At the same time, it's more difficult for the majority of people because majority of people, they don't have any decisions. They don't have anything in their brains, actually, especially in, uh, in, in large corporations. So majority of people just have nothing to say. But in a meeting, it's not so obvious that the person is uh, is clueless and the person has no idea what's going on and cannot actually contribute anyhow. Or his or her contribution is so uh, of a low level, so unprofessional, that it's going to be obvious to everybody if it's done in a written way. So that's why people prefer meetings, because in the meetings you can... Uh, you can pretend to be smart. You can you can smile. You can laugh. You can turn anything into a joke. You can you can use all the instruments to cover your your incompetence, to cover your inability to actually say something meaningful. So you know, it's just you know there has to be a balance because you cannot really get rid of those people who who exist and who are incompetent. You cannot just get rid of them, all of them, because in this case you're going to stay with like twenty percent of your team. But what's going to happen with the rest of the team? So you need to give them the ability to show themselves, to pretend to be uh, pretend to be valuable for the company, for the team, pretend to be working. You you have to give them some you know, some uh, some way to do that. So you need meetings. But at the same time, if you really want effective work of your team, just get rid of the meetings entirely. So in this case. The time zone is not going to be the issue in most cases because it's a written communication. And actually, actually, it's going to even help you because if the time zone is huge, for example, that's a difference like a 10 hours difference. In this case, you will think twice when you write a question to somebody and you will think twice when you write an answer because you know that this is the answer which we're going to be read by those people in 10 hours. And then they will answer you, and you will get the answer only tomorrow. So you have no no chance to uh, to formulate your question poorly, and to, to or to answer some something that it's not really clear to the person who is asking you. You have no luxury for that. You need to be very precise. You need to be very accurate in your answers and your questions, because you don't have the luxury of asking again, because asking again means another day of waiting. So it's very good to have a time zone difference for, for the quality of communication, the quality of the project management. Next question. Uh, what are your opinion? Uh, what are, in your opinion, the main reasons IT salaries are much bigger in the United States than in Europe? Uh, well, it's not only IT salaries. Everything is bigger in the United States. Everything is more expensive. Everything is uh, the salaries in general are higher in the United States. 
the economy is larger everything is bigger the united states of america is uh, the dominating country right now it's the richest country the most powerful that's it's, it's just a, i think it's a rhetorical question you're asking here it's not only about it it's about everything uh, why well uh i would not ask the question why i would ask the question what for because why we can speculate about this for hours like why did it happen because they were more aggressive because they were more smart because they were more uh, liberal because they were more democratic because there were were more uh, militarized we don't know maybe there was a combination of factors there was many things together which led to what we have now but that's that's the fact that they are yeah, extremely powerful country and, and 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 much richer than everybody else. Or maybe the reason is because they have the the United States dollar because they they print the money and the money is the they print the money which is the the number one currency in the world. So that's why they are the richest. The question is what for? This is more interesting. Like, do we need this? Is it is it um, is it effective to the planet? Like, look at what we have in the planet. We have iPhones. We have internet. We have Chat GPT. We have a lot of IT innovative ideas and products, would we be able to create those products if we would not have such a dominating country in the planet? Imagine all countries on the planet are like uh, Indonesia or like, uh, I don't know, Spain or like, uh, um, I don't know, Salvador. Would be and all countries are more or less at the same level. So there is no one dominating country. There is no center where the the, the things like uh, uh, like ChatGPT are being invented. There is no center where the money is printed. There is no such center where the the military power is concentrated. Would the world, would the planet, be able to invent internet? I don't know. So maybe not. That's my answer. Maybe this is. Uh, no matter how much we don't like this situation, no matter how much we, we can say that America uh, is in power for no reason or for a bad reason, but the outcome is obvious, I think. The outcome is that we have so much great things. So I connect this. Maybe I'm wrong, but in my mind, I connect this. I connect that if somebody is in charge and this and this somebody is aggressive enough to dominate and and powerful enough to set the standards and powerful enough to define uh the strategy and to and to suppress everybody who goes against this strategy then the outcome will be good but if you have equal partners all go into all of them go into different directions then in the end most probably you're going to get nothing you're going to get just chaos just just no specific decisions made, no no specific strategy, just a random collection of more or less equal countries. Think about it when we, when we, when we if we project this to the for the team management or the company management, I think in general it's better in most cases it's better to have a hierarchy. It's better to have a pyramid where on top you have somebody who is smart, strong with a clear vision into the future, with a clear strategy, and then everybody else just uh, just submit in, 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 in certain way. Just do what this leader is, is saying, and then the ultimate result will be better. Next question. Uh, you've mentioned owning a business in your past. Could you tell more about that? How did you find clients for the product? Uh, yeah, most of us, <clears throat> most of us, uh, uh, like 25 years ago, were doing uh, programming for for uh, foreign customers, for American clients, for European clients. So I was a programmer, so we were doing uh, programming. So we got together a bunch of people, and uh, we we were we were doing outsourcing. That's that, that was the name, outstaffing, outsourcing. So you find a client on abroad, and then that client sends money to to Ukraine. I was in Ukraine at that time. Sends money to Ukraine. You 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 pay salaries to to your to your programmers, and then you have something for yourself. But I can say it was a very very profitable business. It was profitable when the the salaries of programmers were like a hundred dollars a month, one hundred fifty dollars a month, like just I, like I mentioned. But uh, then th it was all then in this time uh, finished, and uh, the salaries the programmers were getting started to to grow and started to grow quite fast. And when the salary of a programmer is like $3,000 or $5,000, uh, 
then it's difficult. It's way more difficult to, to find a client in America who would pay you, uh, I don't know, five times more because this is how this is what we were making at, at the beginning. So the programmer was getting a hundred dollars a month, and I was getting a thousand dollars a month for this programmer. So that was the difference, one to ten, and that was a profitable business. So you basically have enough, you have enough of resources to cover your uh, unexpected situations. To sometimes these these customers you lose them, and then you still have money to pay your programmers. But if the programmer gets uh, $5,000 and the client pays $7,000 or maybe even $10,000, it's it's difficult to, to manage with such a small margin. So the business, so I decided that it's not any more interesting to run this business. And it's very non-technological business, this outsourcing. So you you don't know what you develop. You don't know what you what, what exactly the technologies you're using. You, you jump from technology to technology. You jump from the language to language. You, you lose people quite frequently because doing outsourcing programming is not really fun for programmers. So basically, good programmers, they don't work for you. They just go find a company which is doing a product, not outsourcing, but a product, not a service model where you develop whatever they ask you to develop, but they do product development. So you lose people, you lose money, you lose customers because you don't have good people. So it's it's quite uh, it's quite uncomfortable business when the cost of programmers are high. When the cost is low, it's okay. You just don't care. But that's that that time is over. When because of political situation, because in, in, when we started that, it was like two thousand. Uh, it was nineteen ninety something, nineteen ninety nine or nineteen ninety eight. That was long. At that time, Ukraine and Russia they were in in total. Uh, in total collapse, there was an extremely poor territory. And at that time, it was good business. Not anymore. <clears throat> Next question. Um, could you please explain the main idea behind your Chashka movie? Uh, I didn't catch it at all. Well, the idea was that you don't catch it at all. That was the, that was the purpose. Um, uh, well, I made it to, to try and see how the process works. So I was interested to, to see what are the ingredients of this mechanism. So how to put people together, how to put the cameraman, how to write the script, how to, uh, to get on, this, on the stage, how to make these takes, and, and then how to uh, glue them together and how to put the sound on top of that. It's a very interesting process, very creative, full of <clears throat> troubles, full of mistakes that people make. Uh, full of people who don't know how to do certain things. And we actually changed a few people during the development of this very short movie. So I can tell you that the preparation to the movie took about half a year. And the shooting was one day. And then making the movie took another two months. So six months you get ready. You find people. You think about the script. You 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 change people. You find another team. You find uh, You calculate the budget. And then one day you just shoot. And then two months, you try to make a movie out of the of the of the files that you. Uh, so how they make large movies, it's hard to imagine for me. So what was the purpose? Was to try it and to give you something that uh, you can. Um, now I'm answering the part of your question, like what what this the main idea of the movie. The main idea is uh, that it's a movie which you're supposed to, as a viewer, you're supposed to cook yourself. It's it's like a semi cooked product. When you go to a supermarket, you buy something, you bring it home, but it's not yet ready. So you need to a little bit cook more. You need to put some more ingredients in there, and then you can eat it. So the same idea was with this movie. So you watch it. It's not complete. So the the movie makers, the filmmaker, didn't complete the story. Didn't make you everything. So you just get it, eat it, and forget it. You take half of it, and the second half, you have to put yourself. So put your emotions, put your story there. So think about what happened to the main guy and to the main character. What was before? Why did he do it? Maybe you can imagine your own story. How would you react in, in such a situation? Have Did it happen to you? Did you see something like that? So that's the idea of a movie. I actually don't like movies which are completely done, which tell the viewer everything, which you just start, you watch, and you know that till the end, they're going to tell you everything. They're going to explain you what happened there. They're going to give you, they're going to connect you all the dots. 
So you will have no questions. You will have nothing to discuss. You will have nothing to uh, to speculate about. You will have no food for thought. They told you everything. You know what happened. You know why they did this. You know why they reacted this way. All you can discuss is maybe, well, I would do it different. But I like more, I like movies which are, uh, which puzzle us as viewers, which just uh, tell us something which we, uh, which we need to, uh, to interpret. Interpretation is a huge uh, ingredient of watching interesting movies, I believe. Interpretation. And I will try to make another movie soon. I actually already have a script and I'm thinking about making another movie. It's going to be a little bit longer, maybe like 10 minutes. And there will also be a lot of room for interpretation. There will be also a story. There's going to be also one character. But now the character will say something. So there will be, there will be some monologue. There will be some, some words. It's going to be said. And uh, again, the viewer will have to understand what is this guy talking about? What happened? Why did he react this way? What happened next? What will happen after that? So what's this story is about? I think it's interesting. Or maybe I just don't know how to write good stories. That's also a possibility. Maybe uh, people who write really interesting stories where all the dots are connected, they're genius story writers. I do not belong to them, that's for sure. Next question. I uh, applied uh, this advice that you gave me. The more we give to people, the more we get back. Uh, okay, now I got a remote job for, for the United States here in Brazil, and I'm an active guy in the Quarks community. Thanks. Well, that's great. That's great. I don't remember saying exactly this, like the more you give to people. Maybe this is in, in a perspective of open source contribution. That's definitely true. Yeah. The more you give to the community, the more the community value you, the more community will respect you, the more uh, visibility the community will give to you, and the more, the better job you will get, the better, uh, the more money you will get. Definitely. Uh, next question, should constructor validate the data? Oh, that's a question about object-oriented programming. Uh, should constructor validate the data passed to it? If so, to what extent? Sanity check or extensive validation? If not, why not? And when and where do you suggest to validate the data? Uh, you can find a blog post about it on my blog. Just find uh, by the keyword uh, validate and you will find I explained it there. So uh, there is a... Uh, it's not a it's not a black and white answer. So there are situations where you do validate, and there are situations where you don't validate. And I, in the blog post, I try to draw this line and explain which situations belong to which category. Now it will take too long to answer and too technical because I will need to show you the code. But you definitely can read the article and uh, hope you get the answer. Next one, uh, where I can buy your books in Russia, not Amazon? Do you plan to extend purchase variants? Well, actually, uh, right now we are uh, in the process of uh, smuggling uh, a big pack of books from America to Russia through all the borders and all the uh, sanctions and everything. So I think that uh, next week or maybe the week after, I will get a huge pack of 60 books uh, to my home in here. Uh, uh, where you can get them, and then you will be able to buy it from me. It took it took three, four months to figure out how to do it, to ship it, to ship it to one country, and then ship it to another country, and then ship it to Russia. So basically, these books will go through three countries, and then they will arrive to Russia. So I I tried to print them here locally, to print them in in not in America, not in Amazon, but. Unfortunately, the quality of printing, I don't know why, but uh, I, I didn't manage to find the printer, the publisher in Russia who can publish the same in the same way. I, I, will, I will try it again, maybe. But uh, what I found, they ask more money for these, for these books than even the Amazon charges, even including all these uh, shipment costs through three borders. So just wait for it. We'll have it. Next question. Many programmers are introverts and can't find a girl. <laughs> so can you give advice how to seduce girls? <laughs> That's an interesting question. Um, let me think for a second. 
how to answer and not offend anybody you know it's very it's very hard to very hard to uh these days to answer uh sensitive questions not offending anybody um well i think that uh Well, first of all, there is dating. I think I'm gonna go, I'm gonna give you just obvious answers right now, which are not something that is uh, new. But uh, I think online, I mean, digital electronic dating is the way to meet people these days. And uh, in America, it's probably the only way to meet people these days. So if you, and there are many jokes about that in America. When I lived there, I remember that. So when you approach somebody, somebody in a bar, and you approach a girl, a woman, and you and you start talking, they will consider you in may in most cases they will consider it as an offensive behavior, and the reaction will be negative or sometimes very negative. But the same girl may at the same time have a profile at Match.com or Tinder.com at the same time. So she's looking for connections. She's looking for uh, for a potential partner. But when this potential partner shows up in the bar, uh, he gets a rejection. But at the same time, other people get uh, way more positive feedback and response when it happens online. So I think it's just the world has changed. Just people believe more in this uh, online digital dating than they believe in uh, in personal contact. Well, for me... Well, I try to adapt to this. I, I kind of understand that. I understand that it's more effective in this digital uh, digital connecting because you can see the person. Uh, you have more options at the same time, and you can choose from them. When when somebody approaches you in the bar, it's only one option for you. You either take it or or leave it, and you will need to spend a lot of time to understand who is in front of you. You need to have. You need to ask questions. You need to investigate that person. You may have uh, something. Uh, um, un you may have something undiscovered, something which you forget to ask about, and then it will come up later when it's too late. While in online dating, you, you see everything there, and you know who is in front of you because all the questions are answered. Actually, I had an interesting case in America using Match.com, and in this Match.com, you have to answer a lot of questions before your profile goes online and it's not like tinder and tinder you just say a few words about yourself you say hey i'm a good guy i'm looking for uh, for a nice girl but in match.com you have to answer who you are where do you work what's your income what's your nationality how many kids you have how many previous wives you have all these uh questions which i skipped because because i was not used to that kind of experience i was thinking like why should I answer all that? Like, we'll figure it out later. First goes the personal connection. And then I got a number of connections. And my uh, uh, my results, they were not so good in this match.com. I didn't get many connections. Actually, I get very few. And I was very surprised. And one lady told me in a quite negative way, quite aggressive way, she, she got upset. She got offended by my profile. She was like, What's wrong with your profile? Why you behave like this on Match.com? And I was like, what did I do wrong? Why are you angry at me? And she said, you make me ask you the questions. Instead of answering them in the profile, you make me ask you, like, how old are you? How tall are you? How many kids you have? So you make me do the work which you had to do before. That's why he got angry at me. And I kind of understood the, the, the reason behind that. So it, it did make sense to me at that time. So the platform actually is uh, making life of people easier. So just explain yourself, give all the details, explain where you work, what you do, what you love, what's your favorite color, what's your favorite food. And then people just match. And if, they, and if she finds out that you like Japanese food and she hates Japanese food, then it's, that's it. She just doesn't connect with you. And and you you find somebody else so maybe that's the way for programmers especially we're like you said we're introverts we're not really good in meeting people at bars so maybe just go to tinder write everything there explain who you are make a good profile make a good picture of yourself and uh, you will find somebody i hope i wish uh, next question um, is there any advice 
uh, you can give to help less competent people become more skilled at work? Um, well, since you're saying less competent, it means you don't mean less smart. So you, you don't mean stupid people who are uh, like um, by nature, by their birth, uh, cannot understand something. And there is no way to fix that. They're just, they're just stupid. And, and that's it. It happens. I mean, some people are smart. Some people are... For some people, something easier. For example, for me, many things in school were difficult to understand, like chemistry, for example. I didn't like it. It was difficult for my brain. So I just try to stay away from it. So I'm not smart in, in, in chemistry. And I think not because I was lazy, not because uh, uh, I was uh, not interested, but because just my brains are not good for it. So in this direction, I'm stupid and that's it. I have to admit it. But in some other directions, I am okay. So you're asking about people who are less competent. Uh, and uh, not less, not not stupid, but less competent. So it means that right now they don't have the skills. Right now they don't know something, and you want them to become more skilled. So I suggest you just, like I said many times, you find a niche problem, a niche technique, uh, a niche um, skill, a niche maybe a programming language or uh, a territory inside the product which the whole team is developing. Uh, something that you, uh, uh, something that you can become good at while at the same time being not a genius in everything. So let's say you, you work in a company where you have very smart senior programmers and there are many of them. And they work there for 10 years and they know a lot. They know a lot, let's say, about C++. But you just join them and you are a way more junior, junior and way less competent. But you don't want it to get out. You want to stand with them. So don't try to become as smart as them, as competent as them. It will take a lot of time and you will lose for many years until you get to the level you're looking for. So find some territory, some, some module, some piece of code, some piece of uh, functionality in your product, something which you can become the best at and start learning it, practicing, learning, writing code specifically for that. Eventually and quite soon, you will see that people start respecting you. Because they will know that you know about this and they can rely on you. They can ask you questions about this part of the code. They will not know that you are incompetent in other domains. Well, they, they will assume that, but they will be uh, respectful enough not to highlight that, not to show your, uh, not to throw it into your face. But if you try to become competent everywhere and try to compete with them, with these high level guys, you will lose and lose and lose for, for a long time. Be niche. That's applicable to many uh, advice, when, many pieces of advice which I give to people on this on these Q&A sessions. Because apparently people ask me about career, about career advice very often. So my recommendation always find a niche uh, topic. Be narrow not wide don't try to be an expert in everything it's the that's the road to failure try to find something where you are the best in the world and invest into this point into this very niche area for 10 years you know it's a famous a famous um, quote from bill gates i'm not sure bill gates actually said it but that that's how i got it so i, I read it that the bill gates said it he said we overestimate how much we can achieve in one year and we underestimate how much we can achieve in 10 years i remember this and i always keep saying it to myself so in one year you don't you cannot achieve a lot just one year it's a very small period of time so don't expect to become successful in one year or two years or three years but if you go on a long run if you if you invest in the long term in 10 years, you will get a lot of results. And that's a mistake a lot of people make. They expect the results to show up in two years. Wait 10. Wait for 10 years and you will see how much you're going to get. Even if you're not very competent. Even if you're not very smart. I think and I, if, if I would invest into chemistry when I was a, a, a school kid, I think I would be 
very effective in 10 years, even with my uh, inability to, with the, with, the, with, the, with the defects of my brain. So it's not really suitable for understanding chemistry. Next question. Uh, <clears throat> my daughter studies Pascal at school and hates it. What language do you think would be suitable for students in grades nine? And is it so important what language to use? Well, I was also studying Pascal when I was in the grade nine. So I was like your daughter. And uh, I can't say I hated it. We were writing actually computer games in Pascal. We were writing some funny applications. I wrote Tetris in Pascal. I remember that. So most probably the daughter doesn't hate Pascal. The daughter just... Uh, hates the, the the tasks which are given to her. I have a I have a, also a blog post about it, so you can go to my blog and uh, search by the the keyword kids or children, and you will find my recommendation article. What I believe we should give to kids in order to motivate them to to become programmers, in order to to become um, uh, to become interested in writing code. I think our job is to give them interesting tasks interesting challenges, interesting problems to solve. So don't give them languages. Don't give them books. Don't give them lectures. Don't train them. Don't, don't even teach them, I believe. But identify the problems which are interesting to solve. And if they have the, the talent and if they have the time, they will go into that. They will, they will solve those problems. So the job of a teacher and unfortunately, I didn't have such a teacher when I was uh, when I was st studying program programming when I was a kid. Unfortunately, I didn't have that. But I would, I definitely would recommend to people right now to try to find such teachers who don't give you lectures, who don't teach you, but who who look at what you're doing, who see what you write, who see the programs that you write, who 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 understands what are your problems right now, what are the issues, what are the challenges you're solving, and they give you a little bit. A correction to that and they say you know it's not really interesting for example right now to write uh, an algorithm for sorting of the numbers in an array it's not really a problem that programmers should solve right now how about you write a mobile game and the mobile game will do this and that and the game will play like this and like that and we me for example and, and the wife if you're talking to a kid so you tell you tell the kid that we together in our family we're gonna play this game or maybe you can make an application for our family and all members of the family will just sign up on this application. It's going to be a family application, which is made by our daughter and we all together are going to use it. The daughter gets interested, I think. It's an interesting challenge. There is no such application on the app store. So there's the potential to become a popular application, something like that. So you as a, as a father, you have to define what's the next problem for the kid to solve. And put those problems in a pipeline, in a, in a timeline, and drive the kid by the uh, by identifying such problems into the future, by by building the future for for a person uh, through defining challenges. <clears throat> Next question: I see a lot of engineers have their own blogs and doing open source a lot. I haven't got enough time to do the same. My job takes all my mental resources. Am I right? These people are doing nothing on jobs. Um, uh, in some, to some extent, you're right. Yeah, to some extent. I would not say nothing because people can combine writing blogs and writing open source and their jobs. They combine. Uh, but I would not say that people don't have, uh, that people make, blogs or they make open source projects because they have nothing else to do. Uh, usually the, 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 um, the motivation is different. Usually the motivation for such activity is that people, uh, um, people believe that, well, people can first, people can, that's the first skill. People can identify problems which are not yet solved. And that's a skill which not so many people have. So when you write something, you always you you constantly solve problems. You make code like I was writing code today the whole day, like eight hours. I just get back from the from the office. I was writing for eight hours nonstop. That's a, just a special day today. And I and I wrote a lot of code. And during this code writing, I for myself uh, 
always trying to uh, i started from other people now i jumped to myself so let's get back to other people so when people write code they uh, some people they uh, uh, they not some all of us we face challenges we face problems we see something is not done we need to do it something is not implemented we need to write it something is done in a wrong way we need to invent a better way so we constantly invent some small solutions invent and implement invent and implement we think this is, should be done this way i've done it before so i will apply this technique here i put these pieces together they're going to work like that it looks okay to me according to my knowledge i put it to production next problem next problem that's how we move forward. So we use our knowledge to solve problems. And some people sometimes, they find, uh, they can generalize what they do. They can see that this is something which I've done before, and this is something that other people have done before. But since we don't have a, a generic solution for that, we don't have a library which does that, we don't have a, 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 a package which I can take somewhere and just use it. So I need to re-implement this stuff for the third time in a month or in a year. So they, they identify general, uh, uh, they can generalize their engineering efforts. And this is what makes people innovators. This is how people invent things. This is how people make patents. This is how people make uh, new libraries. This is how people make new uh, new frameworks. This is how people make in open source products and they start writing blog posts. So they can, from specific problems, generalize and then they want to share it with other people. So first skill which these people have is the ability to generalize from, from specific to, to generic and they have enough ambition to be known for that. So they want to be known for this invention. They, they, it's not enough for them just to generalize and, and say, well, I'm so smart, I made it possible, thank you very much, and then just forget about it. No, they want other people to know that they actually made it possible, that they invented this idea. So they, they, they decide to make it possible. And skill number three, they actually can make it visible. They can write. They can formulate their thoughts. They can explain what they just did. They can uh, structure their code. They can make an open source library. It's not so easy. It's not, it's not that easy as many people think. You need to, to go through a lot of uh, challenges while you're going to make this open source library available on the market, downloadable, packaged right, documented right. And there are some efforts involved. So there are three components of this uh, of this activity. First, you can generalize. Second, you can you you want to be known, so you're brave enough and ambitious enough to show yourself to other people. And number three, you actually can deliver your thought. You can deliver your thinking. So these three components, it's not. I would not say that they just have nothing to do with their job. Usually, these people are quite busy. Usually, these people they 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 write a lot for their for their main projects, but they see that something can be taken out, take, be, can be taken away from, um, from their work. Like today, I made a new open source library today. In the morning, I was solving some technical problems in our Java repository. I found out that something we keep repeating and repeating. So I created a new GitHub repository today and I released a new library. Just uh, one hour ago, I made a new release. You can check my GitHub account. So I generalized the problem which uh, which uh, we were solving, and then I like all these three steps which I just explained to you. You should try it too. You will see how much fun it is. Uh, next question. Uh, good evening. What do you think about studying functional programming? Uh, category theory, type theory, and homotopy type here theory. Will this knowledge be useful in the future? Well, definitely. Like some of these things, I don't even know what it is. Like homo homotopy type theory, I don't know what it is. But I would definitely, if you have time and if you have uh, desire to do that, I would definitely recommend, uh, you know, studying things which are theoretical, just like you mentioned. But not only studying, maybe you can not only study, but maybe you can write something about it. Maybe you can contribute to them. Maybe you can make some changes to them. Maybe you can... You know, introduce something to to this uh, to this uh, scientific domain. Just studying 
I said it many times, it's quite useless activity, in my opinion. If you just study, if you just learn a lot of things, you become smarter. But if you don't contribute back, if you don't change what people did before, if you don't make an increment on top of the knowledge which already was introduced by some other people, then it's uh, I think it's quite a waste of time and it's quite boring activity. It's it's important that you contribute. This is this is what makes you life interesting not only makes you more valuable to uh, to the community but and to potential employers but it makes your life interesting more you know, valuable for yourself um, another question there are two views one is marketing and the second one is real life last one is not bad but everyone looking for something that is offered from advertising well i think that's a comment for the open source my opinion about open source uh, yes, you're right. Well, marketing is, uh, is is something that is difficult to do when you do open source, and it's a that's what's that's what's so discouraging to young programmers when they start open source. They they think that that it's most of them believe that it's important to do open source. Most of them think it's it's good to contribute, it's good to make a library, good to develop something, but they don't know how to make it popular. And when you make something on GitHub and you get two stars in three months or in half a year this is what happened to me when i was starting on github i was getting like seven stars i remember i remember that time i was getting seven stars in like half a year and, and every star was a celebration for me i was i was so excited to see that people actually you know hit that button and they like what i did and i was looking at their names i was checking their profiles i was super interested super yeah, motivated to to see that my work actually is being appreciated, but but you need to wait a lot for that. It doesn't it doesn't happen in a month. It doesn't happen even in a year. It took me I think about three years before something that I was publishing on GitHub started to get maybe a hundred stars. So now the biggest project I have is about one thousand six hundred something like that. It's not it it also it is also not big. It's also not a huge project. So I don't have projects of 10,000 10, stars. I wish to have them, but I don't. I don't know how to get there. I don't know how to get so much so much likes, so much stars, so many, uh, so much audience, so big audience, which is... Uh, but how to get 10 stars, I know. But most people don't. And that's what uh, discourages them to go into open source, unfortunately. And this is, by the way, why... Okay, let me finish on the with the promotion. So we are restarting the, um, the, the quality competition of open source projects. If you follow me for quite a while, you probably remember that I had uh, a quality, a code quality award on my blog. And I was doing it since 2015. So that was eight years ago. So I started that. That was the idea. So you send me your open source projects. I put them into uh, a competition. And then I decide which project is the winner. So which project is done with the best quality in mind. So I don't care about your popularity. I don't care how many stars you have. I only care about how qual how high is the quality of your design, of your uh, organization, of your project, how, how well is continuous integration, how well is uh, unit testing there, that kind of aspect. And I gave money to people, like the financial rewards for that. And that was, you know, so far I gave... Uh, almost twenty thousand dollars in in eight years. So this year we restarted again, and we call it this time Kai Code, KaiCode.org. I will send you. I will I will show the link in the in the description under the the video. So if you have an open source project and you pay attention to quality, you just submit this project to Kai Code competition. Your project will be listed there. That's for that's for starters. And then you may you may become a winner. You may become a, a platinum winner, a gold winner, a silver winner. You get the money from me. Not not only from me. We're looking for sponsors right now. So we're gonna get together sponsors, and we get together the jury, and then we're gonna celebrate this in about six months. So if you wanna submit your project, do it now. If you wanna participate in the jury, so you can help us review the projects, uh, send an email. It's on the website. If you want to be the sponsor, you're welcome. You can give some money. We're going to be list you. We're going to list you on the website as well as a sponsor. So that's going to be the festival of open source projects every year. Every year you send stuff to us. We celebrate. We make a festival. We we choose the winners, and that's how we help young developers to become more popular. 
to get this recognition at the beginning, to get the first 100 stars. After that, it's easier. But the first step is the most difficult. Um, so that's it, I think. Okay, one last question and we finish. So that's a question about my PMBA course. Your course was great. Are you planning to release an English version of your SQM class? Well, SQM is quite large course. It's 24 lectures and it's all in Russian. Unfortunately, that's the requirement of the university. They demanded me to do it in Russian. I would love to do it in English, but that's the requirement of the university. Maybe in some time I will try to do it in English for another university. I'm thinking about it, but maybe it will happen. But I don't really see the big reason for that because the course, the videos, they have the Russian subtitles, which are automatically translatable to English. So you can easily uh, switch to English and, and watch the course in, with English subtitles. But maybe I'll do, uh, I'll do an English one. Okay, thanks for coming. That's it for today. One hour is enough. See you next Friday, the same time, the same channel. We're going to do English-Russian, English-Russian. So this time it was English. Next time we do Russian. The previous time was Russian. So it's going to be different language of this Q&A session. Uh, for some reason, Russian uh, sessions, they get uh, more viewers. They get more, uh, the, the audience gets bigger. But I do want to, uh, to, to, you know, to connect with people who don't speak Russian. So that's why we're going to switch from Russian to English, from English to Russian. Thanks for today. See you next time. Bye-bye.